Hey Buccaneers, Kevin McKay here, game contributor with Firelock Games. This is another in our series of videos explaining the rules for Blood and Plunder. Today's video will be explaining Chapter 3, Game Essentials. Blood and Plunder uses 10-sided dice to determine the outcome of most situations in the game. Now you veteran gamers will know these as D10, and to save time for the rest of these videos you will probably hear us refer to them as D10, the same as it is explained in the rulebook. A handful are required to play, we recommend 12 dice for a, each side, that's a good number. If you're like me, I recommend also this handy accessory, a dice rolling cup. Helps to prevent those unplanned casualties from dice crashing into your units or rolling off the table. Now rolling the zero result, like I did right here on this D10, counts as what we call a natural 10. That's a 10 with no modifiers, and in most games like this, including Blood and Plunder, it's often an automatic success. Conversely, a roll like this right here we call a natural 1, which is the automatic fail roll. Now if the dice or the rules refer to rolling a d5 at any point. That's simply taking your result, rounding or cutting it in half and rounding it up. So this 10 here would become a 5, whereas this 5 would become a 3. Now one final note about dice rolling is at any time if the rules require you to re-roll, whether you spend a fortune point or some other reason, you may only take one re-roll. That means the die can only be re-rolled one time. Tests are the terminology we use in Blood and Plunder to determine the outcomes of most situations in the game. So a test will have a target number, and sometimes that target number is set, for example, when repairing a ship, and sometimes it is based on a skill, such as a resolve or a fight test, like you see here on the cards. The way that a test is resolved then is you take that target number, and your dice roll must meet or exceed that number in order to be successful. So for example, these two freebooters here have been in a unit which has suffered casualties and now they need to roll a resolve test. The resolve for them right here is a five, so I will roll two dice here and what we have are a two and right off camera here we rolled a natural 10 like you've heard earlier in this video. That means that one of the results, the two has failed but the 10 has succeeded. Now certain effects or conditions in the game will make target numbers easier or harder to reach. And we call these effects modifiers. Now since we are attempting to meet or exceed that target number, a bonus will be a negative number which takes away from that target number making it easier to achieve. By contrast, a penalty will be a positive number making that target number harder to achieve. So to demonstrate, I'll use one of the more common penalties that you'll find in the game, and that is the range penalty. So our freebooters from our last segment there are now poised to shoot at our boucanier, who is at a very close distance and therefore will receive no range penalty. However, if our boucanier here was across the table, then now they will have a range penalty of, we'll say, 2. So it's a negative, it's positive 2 in this case, and that makes their shoot test or target number, an 8. They have to be 8 or better in order to succeed. One thing to note also is if your target number is ever 11 or greater, it may not even be attempted unless another rule says it is allowed. Measuring distances in Blood and Plunder is important for several aspects of the game, such as unit movement or ranged attacks. The rulebook includes a ship turning gauge that incorporates a 4-inch ruler, which is useful for measuring movements, but not sufficient for longer distances, such as shooting range. If you do not wish to cut the pages out of your beautiful Blood and Plunder rulebook, the templates can be found online at firelockgames.com. Now, distances in the game are measured in inches, and we recommend a tape measure of at least 36 inches. Our friends using the metric system may benefit from a tape with both values. Now, this is a game of piracy and privateering, not math. 
inexact measurements are considered between two whole numbers and are rounded down. So the 8.9 here would still be considered an 8. Now go ahead and measure at any time, whether on your turn or not. Keep the flow of the game going, but don't give away all of your strategy if you can avoid it. Now when measuring, you want to use the two closest points. When measuring between units, use the bases of the two closest models from each unit. All models in both units will be considered this distance apart, regardless of their location in the formation. So what we have right here are these two units would be considered 10 inches apart because the closest model is still within 10 and 11 inches. Now for structures, you'll want to use the closest structural component, such as a ship's hull, or in the case of this cathedral, the wall here and not the buttress on the outside. Players will need several markers that track various effects throughout the game, such as fatigue, reloads, and ship critical damage. Now, any markers can be used. Some examples are dice, tokens, polyfill smoke, or whatever else you may have just lying around the house. You know, like poker chips, colored cubes, bottle caps, glass beads, pretzels, mini marshmallows, mini hippos, bass fishing lures, kaiju, throwing stars, or, of course, you can always use the full line of custom markers produced by Firelock Games. There's one for fatigue, reloads, ship critical damage. A standard deck of cards, jokers included, possess all of the necessary information to resolve initiative and determine number of actions. This will be covered in Chapter 4. Firelack Games also produces a Bonnie sets of decks for each of the factions in the game. These decks have all of the information printed right on them that you will need. I should mention at this point, failure to use these custom decks will result in your units suffering a terrible curse. Blood and Plunder can be played on a small table, but the game really shines on a play area of 3 by 4 feet when playing with fewer than 200 points, and 4 by 6 feet for larger engagements and ship battles. Now, terrain pieces of the game's 28 millimeter scale will be required and are not produced by Firelock Games. These add tactical options and make your table look awesome. If you lack the funds to purchase or the skills to manufacture fancy terrain, a trip around the house can provide adequate substitutes. In five minutes, we came across a hill, a building, and a pond. The important thing is to have the terrain for land battles, regardless of how it looks. Terrain is necessary to make land battles fun to play, while you can play sea battles on a blue tablecloth. If you are watching this, chances are you are a gamer. As such, you can appreciate that game designers don't always close every loophole or foresee every potential conflict within the rules. When this happens, first discuss with the other players to attempt consensus. We prefer you agree and have fun, then get the rules exactly right. Who knows, if you post your quandaries and solutions to our forums, you may change the game. Of course, if consensus remains elusive, the almighty die roll can objectively solve any disagreement. Most importantly, have fun. There were no rules lawyers during the golden age of piracy. Throughout the rulebook and instructional videos, the individual miniatures are referred to as models. A group of models of the same type acting together become a unit. And all of the player's units and related miniatures, such as ships and artillery, these comprise the player's force. Knowing this terminology will help in understanding the rules that follow. Units must be cohesive. This means in a unit of 12 models or less, every model must be within four inches of every other model in the unit. So you see here, look at that four inch on the template there. It's gonna be very useful throughout the game. The Blood and Plunder rulebook contains templates to make these measurements easier if need be. Right there. The templates help demonstrate that the infamous conga line is not a cohesive unit. 
When using the template, keep in mind the bases only need to be partially within the 4 inch circle to be considered cohesive, as you see here with this unit of three models. At the end of an activation, a unit that is not cohesive gains a point of fatigue, which we'll get to in a later chapter. When a unit takes actions, every model within the unit will take the same action, such as shooting or going prone. There are a few exceptions to this, which will be covered in a later chapter. Models, regardless of which way they are facing, can act in a 360 degree arc, as long as there is no impediment to that action, such as shooting through terrain that blocks line of sight. Sorry people, there are no flanking bonuses in Blood and Plunder. Units have a control zone around them of 3 inches from each of the perimeter models, preventing enemy units from entering this bubble unless they are prepared to charge in and engage in melee combat. We've demonstrated this here for clarity. Many of you will already be familiar with the concept of line of sight. This refers to the ability of a unit to see models and enemy units in order to attack them. Your tape measure can serve double duty here, acting as a straight edge to check this line while measuring your distances. In this example, out here in the open, this model here has a clear line of sight to each model in the enemy unit. This is a great example of the value of terrain. The line must travel from base to base without passing through impediments like another standing unit. In this example, the Lanceros are blocking line of sight from the Milicianos Indios to the Freebooters and vice versa. Now don't think you can be sneaky. You may not trace between the models in the unit. Now other examples of impediments which block line of sight are large solid objects like sections of high walls or buildings. Some terrain does not block line of sight such as low walls, fences, and low areas of vegetation. Lines of sight can be traced from all models in a unit and added up to maximize the number of valid targets. So, in this example, the Milicianos Indios are attacking the Freebooters right here. Now this poor guy right here out in the open, well he can trace line of sight to four of the models in the Freebooters unit. So he can make one valid attack against these four models. Conversely, if the Freebooters were attacking the Milicianos Indios, these four models would be able to trace line of sight only to the one model in this unit. However, they have four valid attacks on the one model. Now let's make things a little bit more interesting and put the Milicianos Indios in a slightly better strategic position. Now this is where that concept of adding up your line of sight really comes into play. Because if you were to trace line of sight for this model right here, well, he cannot make a valid line of sight to this model here. However, this guy here, well, he sure can. So he can have a valid line of sight here, and every other model has at least one line of sight. So we have six valid lines of sight against the four models in the Freebooters unit. Keeping in mind that once again, these two models here are out of line of sight for everybody in this unit. So we have six valid attacks against these four models. Once again, conversely, if the Freebooters were attacking the Milicianos Indios, these four can trace line of sight to at least each one of these models. So they have four valid attacks against all six models of the Milicianos Indios. A unit one inch or higher than another standing unit may trace line of sight over that unit to a target behind it. Just remember folks, this works both ways. So in this case, the freebooters can also trace line of sight to the Milicianos Indios. When the enemy unit is partially hidden or at a different elevation, true line of sight can be used to determine what the unit can see. This is done by looking low over the model's head to see from its vantage point. In this example, the Milicianos Indios are checking true line of sight to the freebooters behind the low wall. Now, as you can see, all of the freebooters' torsos are clearly visible. 
Therefore, they are all within line of sight of the Indios. If the target is partially obscured by, say, a short wall, extremities, such as a sword arm or musket barrel, are not acceptable targets. The torso of the model must be clearly visible in order to trace true line of sight. As much as these milicianos would love to blow the poofy hat off of the French commander, the flea bustier on the right is the only acceptable target in this scenario. Every model type currently available has stats that can be found in Chapter 9 of the rulebook. In addition, there are unit cards for quick access to that unit's stats and abilities. Each model type has the following stats. Play along at home using this unit card for the English freebooters. Number 1. Experience level. Units start the game inexperienced, trained, or veteran. This determines how many actions that model can take. Number two, in the upper right corner is the points per model, which is only used during force creation and refers to the model's cost. Number three, fight and shoot values, which are split into offensive and defensive values, and resolve. For fight values, the skill is the target number used to score hits in melee combat. The save value is the target number to defend against an enemy onslaught. For shoot values, the skill here is the target number before modifiers to score ranged hits. The save is the target number to defend against ranged hits and only applies when the unit has some form of cover. Resolve is the value for the target number when attempting to resist or remove fatigue. Number four, weapons. A list of the weapons a model may carry. Main weapons are usable throughout the battle. Sidearms are used only once. And number five, special rules. A list of the special abilities the model possesses. These are printed on the back of the unit cards or found in the special rules section of chapter nine. Each force must include one and only one commander. The commander also has a unit card, which in addition to its weapons and special rules, has values for command range and command points. More to come on those. The commander must begin the game attached to a core unit and will activate with that unit. The commander does not count against the unit's maximum size. For example, in a game where 12 is the maximum unit size, the commander can still be added as the 13th model. Notice on the card, the commander has no fight, shoot, or resolve skills. The commander adopts the fight skill and save, shoot skill and save, and resolve value as well as the special rules of the host unit. He also adopts their experience level for the purposes of taking actions. In other words, the commander acts with the unit except when using his command points, which again will be explained later. The host unit gains any special rules the commander has. The commander has its own weapons and equipment. For example, a commander with no long-range weapon, such as a musket, may not make long-range attacks with the rest of the unit. When the commander leaves a unit, the host loses the special rules given, and the commander loses any it gained from the host. Fatigue is the effect placed on units for suffering the horrors of war, such as exhaustion and diminishing morale. Fatigue can be gained when a unit is successfully hit in combat. Players can also push their own units past their normal performance level and gain fatigue in the process. With fatigue, three is a magic number. Once a unit has three or more fatigue, it is considered shaken and is no longer effective until reduced to less than three. Players may not intentionally push their units into gaining three or more fatigue. When a unit gains a large amount of fatigue, it risks routing and being removed as casualties. Fatigue will be revisited in greater detail in Chapter 5. So that was Chapter 3 of the Rulebook. If you have any further questions about the game essentials, please post on our forums at firelockgames.com. See you next time.